Hello, everyone, and, uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is Pantelis Solomon, and I am a principal advisor here at the Behavior Insights team, and I manage our work in, uh, in financial behavior. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all here and discuss new ideas um, to help people meet their financial goals. Uh, our mission of BIT has always been to use insights from behavioral science to help, uh, to help people lead better, healthier lives. And when it comes to people's finances, there are several statistics that call for our attention. For example, in the UK, um, 11 and a half million adults um, have less than 100 pounds in savings. 13.5 uh, million work, working people in the UK regularly run out of money. And about 9 million people borrow money to buy essential uh, services like food and, and, to pay, and to pay their bills. So with these challenges in mind, we, at the Behavioral Insights team, we, we set up a partnership with, um, called the Financial Capability Lab, which was with the, with the Money Advice Service at the time, now it's, the, it's called the Money and Pension Service, um, in order to address some of these challenges. And in particular, we, we wanted to explore new ideas uh, to, to help encourage, to encourage people to build up a savings buffer to withstand financial shocks, uh, to help them manage their spending and take control of their credit decisions, and to encourage them to take financial guidance. So at the beginning of our journey, we, we explored uh, over 200 ideas, and then we, 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 we talked to policymakers, academics, specialists in the, in the areas of financial well-being and capability, uh, and then we narrowed these ideas down to 17 ideas, which we tested using our online platform, Predictive, and, uh, and using qualitative research. And then after we finished that first phase, then we are then um, take, we took the most promising of those ideas and we are now testing them in the, in the field with, with financial services companies. So we're currently in the process of recruiting new partners. And you may have heard, for example, our partnership with Monzo. So, so with Monzo, what we're doing is we're developing a tool which will allow customers to block spending with specific merchants in the Monzo app. Uh, and we will use soft psychological frictions to help users to stick to their commitments. Uh, customers setting up the block will be asked to write a note to them, remind themselves why they're setting up the block. Um, then the Monzo will then show customers the note if they try to unblock the block, uh, the block merchants. Uh, this is a very kind of soft friction uh, with no hard restrictions, but research shows that these types of frictions can be very uh, effective in encouraging people um, to, to, to stick to their, um, to, to their goals. However, we don't, you know, we, we've came up with these ideas, but we don't, we don't want to stop there. Uh, we're always looking to support new ideas, uh, which is, and which is why we're organizing this session today. Um, we invited three entrepreneurs to talk about their ideas uh, that they're developing, and we're hoping that your input and the feedback that they get from our excellent uh, panel of judges um, will help this, these entrepreneurs develop their ideas further in order to support people helping lead better financial lives. So I very much hope you enjoy the session, and I'm going to hand over to Claudia. Hello again, everybody. I'm Claudia Hammond. Um, I'm really pleased to be um, to see that I was doing this session. Um, a because uh, love a competition, um, and uh, B because uh, there is uh, just so much scope for. Um, interventions and different kinds of ways of helping people deal with their money and I wrote a book about the psychology of money and it was just so clear looking at the best research from around the world that there are there are so many opportunities there so I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what people have to say uh, today because today is all about putting the research um, into practice um, and we're asking what can be done to help any of us to set and achieve our financial goals and to enjoy the process and so this is the challenge that we have set three people who've come along to pitch today they're going to pitch to you and to our judges, who I'll introduce in a moment. So we're doing this kind of Dragon's Den style, um, except our judges will be friendly dragons. So it's a little bit more sort of puff the, dra puff the magic dragon than the far-breathing kind. Obviously, that's a joke that shows my age there, but he puff the magic dragon. He was nice. Um, this is what's going to happen. I will, um, once we've got the judges, I will introduce each of our speakers in turn, um, and they will have just five minutes, a very strict five minutes, with they've got a clock um, here that counts them down, to uh, make their pitch. After each pitch, there'll be a short time where the uh, judges will ask them a few questions, um, and then it's your turn. So, um, again, do use Slido to ask the, um, quest any questions that you have of the um, different people pitching. And then the judges will sum up what they think, and then it will be your turn um, to vote. 
Um, and the prize for the winner is, one, a, a glow of satisfaction at having won, which is something that money, money can't buy, and also a signed copy of David Halpern's Inside the Nudge Unit, which is something that money can buy. So um, <laughs> they um, will get both of those, which is, is uh, rather lovely, I think. Um, so let me introduce our other judges. Um, we have um, uh, Pantelise, who you've already met, um, and we also have Polly uh, McKenzie, do, do come on, who's the chief executive of the think tank uh, Demos, and she was director of policy to the deputy prime minister, Nick Clegg, and helped to write the coalition agreement. Do come sit just there. Um, but more recently, she founded the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute, which is a charity working to break the link between financial difficulty and mental health problems. Really interesting there. Um, and also so we have um, Bertrand Begin, um, who is the CEO of Change Square, which is a corporate finance firm for sustainable ingest investing. Um, and pitching, we will have three people. We will have Max Morby, Kristen Berman, and Archie Chapel. And I will introduce each of them in turn as they speak. So first up, we have Max Morby, who is head of behavioral science at Plum an intelligent app for saving and growing your money. And Max used to be head of, the, head of financial behaviour at the Behavioural Insights team. Uh, before that, he studied behavioural science at uni the University of Copenhagen. So can we give Max a warm welcome, please? Hello. So I have a clicker. Good. I'm counting down already. Okay, so hi, I'm Max <laughs> Morby. I'm the head of behavioural science at Plum. I'm here because there's a problem with managing money, and that problem is pretty big. So that problem comes from really a mismatch between how governments and regulators assume that given freedom, we're all going to work out how much we should save and actually make those savings. We're going to shop around aggressively for the best deals, and we're going to pay attention to maybe what we're earning on our savings. So all of us as behavioural scientists in the room, I think, understand that that's a view of people as, as econs that maybe is most of the time not going to be borne out. And actually what we understand as behavioural scientists and also at Plum is that these numbers come from people taking decisions in a different way to how the system expects them to. And one of the other upshots of that is this really, really... Um, big number, you know, and that's a huge proportion of our friends and our family who are affected by money stress. Um, and this is something that many of us at Plum care a lot about. So why is it so hard? Why are those numbers so big? So just to take one example. So to decide whether to spend or save, I need to first predict the future. What am I going to do with my money in a month or a year's time? If I have decided that, then, you know, I need to make a trade-off. I'm a millennial. I might want to buy avocado toast tomorrow. Or I might want to, you know, maybe save for a house in 30 years' time. That's a difficult trade-off to make. And finally, if I have decided to save, there are all these self-control problems, attention problems, that mean that we might not make the payments that we intend to. And, you know, when life happens, we might forget to change them or cancel them. So these people are also humans. They're our co-founders. Um, so they also had no savings, and they set each other a challenge to see how much they could save. So Victor, this guy, he is a Harvard-educated economist, so he thought he'd back himself to set a budget and set aside the money that he saved from sticking to his budget. Alex, this other guy, he um, is uh, the techie one. So he wrote an algorithm that would analyze his transaction data on his current account and would automatically transfer that from his current account to his savings every couple of days. You know, an amount that the, the algorithm thinks is uh, achievable. After a couple of months, Alex had beaten Victor quite significantly. So the algorithm had beaten a Harvard-educated economist by about two times. So they thought that was a good idea for a business. So um, Plum automates to help you achieve your financial goals. It does automated saving, automated utility switching, and also investments as well. So I'll take you through. So this is Plum. Plum is talking to you in, in Facebook Messenger or in your app. And that is how you save with Plum. Totally automatic, an affordable amount that will be transferred out every few days. Nice and easy. Next, utility switching. So here we'll automatically tell you when we think 
that well, Plum will, not we, Plum will tell you uh, when it thinks it can save you money. And it will give you a simple comparison between your existing supplier and a cheaper option, an option that Plum thinks will save you money. And you can get here in about 45 seconds. Now, that is a huge time saving against what I used to do, which is uh, thousands of tariffs and hundreds of suppliers um, across, uh, uh, across uh, a price comparison website. Finally, our investment splitter. So this helps humans avoid the vagaries of the market where you might put more in when the market's doing well or maybe not put less in when the market is doing less well. This automates your future deposits into, into Plum automatically between the various different things you're doing. So we think this could save up to around £2,000 a year for the person on average income. That's a huge impact. But actually what I really care about, and you know, from my previous work, is actually the impact on people feeling whether they're achieving their financial goals. These are really cool things to be hearing when you survey your customers. You know, that freedom from money worries is incredibly impactful, and it's what so many of us who work at Plum really care about. So to recap, Plum is an automated financial service that will grow your money and hopefully put you on a, free to, on a journey to freedom from money worries. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Do come and sit here, and the judges will, will have some um, questions uh, for you. Um, who'd like to start? Polly, what would you like to ask? Uh, thank you for that, um, and a uh, great product. I guess automation uh, makes life simple whilst life is simple. How do you deal with shocks and unexpected circumstances? Yeah, so um, I think the really big difference about Plum is that the algorithm will react to there being less money in your account. So if you have uh, a, a low amount of funds available when, uh, when the algorithm runs uh, its automated saving run, then it will save less or save nothing at all if you don't have those funds. So uh, yes, it is a big problem. But hopefully, if, uh, if your funds are taken out in time when, they, when the saving run runs, then, uh, then it should protect you uh, from that. So does that mean you don't have the thing of needing to have perhaps the psychological cushion of, like the person said there, that it's calming to know that you've got a bit of money? So sometimes, often, people will want to keep some money in their current account to know that it's safe. But this will do that for you. So it won't let you go overdrawn. It will stop taking the savings away. Exactly, yeah. So we, we, we're very concerned and, and we built into the algorithm when it runs, um, like a shyness factor to, to make sure that it doesn't put people overdrawn. Um, if you were ever to go overdrawn with Plum, we would uh, refund uh, any money that you were charged um, because that is definitely not what we want to be doing. Bertrand. I really like the idea. It's pretty powerful. Um, you know, same questions as Polly, but um, I'm really interested also, how would you make money behind this? So uh, a number of ways. So uh, we hope that people will want to pay us to use Plum. Um, and uh, part of the reason that I joined Plum was to uh, build all the ideas that I have about behavioral science into the, uh, uh, into the app. And uh, hopefully lots of those new features will be exciting and will help people think that there's even more value and will pay us. And we already have a significant number of subscribers. Um, and in addition, uh, switching uh, your bills is a really good way um, to to do business in a way that I want to do business, which is uh, the customer wins, i.e. we've saved you money from switching your utilities, is, is what I showed there, um, and we win as well because uh, we've introduced you to a new supplier. Pantelis. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Max. I think it was, it was really nice, the very great product. Um, I, was, I think I was particularly struck by your argument that um, deliberate savings seems kind of less effective than, uh, than automated savings, especially from a Harvard economist. Um, although it's only a sample of two, but um, <laughs> uh, to some extent, I think some of this is kind of the automation is, is kind of reminiscent a little bit of uh, kind of pensions auto enrollment, where we kind of made it easy for people, uh, and uh, and as we all know, it has a, it had a, a kind of a staggering effect on, on, on kind of uh, pension signups. At the same time, though, uh, by doing that, we we've kind of made people less engaged with their pensions and, and their savings potentially. Uh, and so they, 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 it does kind of, there remains a question about the impact on people's financial capability and, and kind of uh, habits. So do you expect your product to improve people's financial uh, capability and instill good habits, uh, given that you're making it so easy for them? Uh, it's, it's a very good question. So um, I think 
the first part of the answer is that um, there's a huge problem. And I flashed up those numbers on the screen, right? With, you know, it is already a massive problem. People don't shop around. People don't save. People don't pay attention to where their money is being saved. So anything that we can do with Plum should improve their actual financial position, firstly. Um, and secondly, because we're making things easier, so for example, on the utility switching product, we're not actually, uh, uh, we're not actually like switching you like without any input from you. You actually do have to spend the 45 seconds to switch yourself, evaluate the option that we give you uh, that we think will save you money, or that, sorry, that Plum thinks will save you money. Um, and, but you do still have to take a conscious decision. Um, and that's an easier decision, yes, but you do still have to work out whether you want to take the decision. And we hope that by being able to take more financial decisions, I would hope that your, um, uh, your financial capability would be maintained. Polly, what else would you like to ask? Um, so some of the work that we did at Money and Mental Health looked at uh, people's ability to kind of cause themselves harm with their finances. You're talking about people being quite lazy, but, but actually, you know, during periods of poor mental health, you know, uh, I'm going to get a criticism from Pantelis on our sample, but uh, it was a non-representative sample, but 92% said that they spent more when they were unwell. And I wonder if you're thinking about, in terms of developing for the future, how do you help people build a, a really protective environment about themselves that goes beyond the, the kind of, uh, goes beyond simply protecting themselves from laziness? Yeah, so, so I disagree with laziness as a, uh, as a characterization of the problem here. So I don't think the problem is that, that people are inherently lazy or bad. Like, I think the problem is the mismatch between the system, which expects them to take decisions in a certain way, and actually how they actually do take decisions. And it's not wrong, right? It's just, it's just different to this model. You, know, you think of the model of econs and humans. It's just a different way of decision-making that we don't expect people. But yes, like um, of the many things that I'm working on, I'm still in my second month, I think, um, one of the things I'm most excited about is... Um, giving people uh, simple, actionable feedback on their spending, uh, which can become part of a daily or whatever habit that you want to do. So um, without having to do all the maths, you know, so you think about the intervention uh, that Monzo, for example, is giving you, where it's, giving, it's shoving more and more information into your brain, like, you spent this, you spent that, it's in this category, it's in that category, when actually what you're asking people to do there is spend more and more and more and more of their time taking financial decisions. What I want to do with Plum, and hopefully helping people uh, build a kind of m more protective spending understanding, is actually do that without jamming loads more information in their head and find a simple, actionable way to give feedback that allows people to protect themselves um, rather than having to do loads of work and be econs. So, Pantelis or Bertrand, is there anything else you'd like to ask before we move yeah, on? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm interested. Most, a lot of the categories of people that you, you'd be helping out probably finished at the end of the month with zero. So how do you help them change their behaviour so that you, know, that you can help them save? But there's no point to help them save halfway through and then suddenly there's nothing left. Yeah, so, um, so my understanding, I'm still getting to get into grips with the customer base and, and the data science, but my understanding is that actually we have quite a wide range of people um, and incomes using mm. the product. Um, and there, are, there are people who definitely get to the month, end of the month with zero, but there is a whole range of other people who, uh, um, who maybe ha are in a better financial position mm -hmm. in, in, on that particular metric. So it's not everybody who's there, but for the people who are there, um, I think one of the key things that I would do would be the spending insights that I was just talking about, trying to help them. Um, and it may be actually quite a long time when you're talking about that kind of metric, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, change their spending behavior so that they do have a little bit left over at the end of the month. But actually, the automatic savings product that we already have, so um, the really cool thing about it is when you, when, you, when you see people or you interview people who are using the product, um, they say, I, I got to zero at the end of the month, but I had 20 or 100 or 200 pounds in my plum savings, which had got there. You know, that's magical. That's, that's a pot that just wouldn't have existed if plum hadn't have transferred it automatically during the month. Um, so hopefully, even those people will mm -hmm. have something, even if it's a small amount, in their plum account. 
Well, thank you very much for that. And we will move on to our next pitch. Um, and this is from Kristen Berman. Uh, Kristen co-founded Irrational Labs, which is a behavioral product <coughs> design company with Dan Ariely in 2013. And they help organizations to increase health, wealth, and happiness of their users. And she also co-founded Common Sense, which is a Duke University initiative dedicated to improving the financial well-being of low to middle income Americans. And that has launched more than 50 50 different experiments. Over to you. Great. So I'm going to talk today about the least innovative, least sexy, but most obvious behavioral answer to financial health. So as we know, there is a savings problem. People do not save. In America, the numbers are quite stark. 40% of people save less than $400. But the good news is, is that the answer is quite obvious. And in fact, people in this room, we all know the answer. It's one of the favorite behavioral science tricks that we have. It is, think to yourself, the default. So basically, we need to take the paycheck and default a little bit of money into savings. So if you know the paycheck right now, currently money goes from the paycheck and into the checking account. It does not go, none of it really goes into the savings account. So we all know this study as well, that basically the default was used with quite success with the retirement savings account, increasing the amount of money that people save into their retirement savings with just making the choice architecture a little bit easier. Great, and so we also know Common Sense did a study that basically asked people in their mobile banking app how they wanted to save. To sign up for a savings account is a dry test, but over 60% of people chose automatic savings, which means that it is more of an intuitive answer to the consumer. And we know that matching inflows and outflows is actually uh, decreases the likelihood of fees. And so when you put those two together, less people have overdraft fees. So all together, this seems obvious. Behavioral scientists know it, consumers know it, and it actually works. So What's happening? Why isn't this working? And so there are two points of leverage, at least in the American system, but I hypothesize other systems as well. One is banks, where you can take money from the deposit and transfer into savings. And second is the payroll provider, where you basically have the paycheck, people sign up for direct deposit. And so our team looked at all of these, the top banks and the top payroll providers, and what is happening? Absolutely none of them are using a default. In fact, not only are they not using a default, they are making it difficult. So in the top banks, it's hidden under the menu. So there's an average of two clicks, sometimes four clicks, to actually get to automatic savings from or automatic transfers from a bank. And in payroll providers, it's actually more offensive. There's buttons that say add an account. And so you have to click the button and then enter your savings account number. In Gusto, actually, you can only add one account. You have to go back later and edit if you ever want to add a savings account to direct deposit. Perhaps more offensive is what we call this empty text field. We say death by empty text field, is that when you're actually asking people how much to save, there's no default, there's no anchor, there's no nothing. It's just an empty text field. And you see this, and this is obviously a tough decision. You're asking people how much to save. Very big decision. And we see this in payroll providers even worse. I'm going to click through about six screenshots that show how empty text fields just are pervasive in payroll providers. This is from bills on their mobile apps. Paychecks, ADP, Gusto, Intuit, all the top payroll providers have empty text fields asking people how much they should save. So what could the experience look like? So there's two solutions here. One is to change the UX and UI. That's actually the simple one where you change what things look like. And the second is to change the incentive system because we have to convince banks and payroll people to to do this thing. And that's actually the harder thing. I'm going to go through the UX, UI. So these are mock-ups that we did. Um, Basically, if you're a bank, you can ask people at the point of enrollment to uh, sign up for a savings account. Sadly, in the US, you can't automatically enroll them. This is not legal. And so we have to use what behavioral science knows is a forced choice in order to get more people to opt in. Massive uh, opportunity to actually increase the likelihood that people save. We can do progress milestones by having people set a goal, use round numbers, which we know people like. And, of course, the famous default with smart anchors that help people simply save. By the way, percentages are better than fixed amounts because if you have income volatility, you want to save as a percentage and not a fixed amount. All banks ask you to save in a fixed amount versus a percentage. Okay, payroll providers, a little bit more interesting. We basically have to think about how we equalize the fair and make it a fair fight between savings accounts and routing numbers, or savings accounts and checking accounts. We have an ordering effect, so typically payroll providers ask checking accounts first, and then you have a click a button for savings. We simply want to make the savings account uh, uh, first, and then you can also basically have the payroll provider offer, if they don't have a savings account, offer to send them a no-fee savings account. And finally, just put something in the box. 
<laughs> we don't want any more empty text fields. Smart anchors, this is obviously an imperial question of what actual anchors there are, but we can do so much better than an empty text field. Okay, so now for the harder question, which is basically how do you convince these folks to do something? So this is convincing a baker or a payroll provider to do anything. And so we've learned through our experience, you never lead with consumer health, you only lead with the business opportunity. And for banks, it's around increasing deposits. And for payroll people, payroll providers, it's around creating a relationship with the actual employee and not just the employer, which can happen through a financial wallet. But we have to go even further into the non-obvious things. And one of our um, things that we're thinking about is how would you convince a bank to do anything? Obviously, it's fees. Can we create a fee in order to have in charge customers if they are not saving? And finally, we can reframe some of the benefits. Automatic transfer, not interesting. Wealth protection could be much more interesting. They could become a thought leader. Um, and then last, for payroll providers, um, very, very difficult in order to uh, convince an employer to do a match, but they could create a, a marketplace in order to do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was very interesting. You packed a lot into your, into your five, five minutes there again as well. Uh, Pantelise, do you want to start? Yeah. Uh, thank you. That, that, was, that was great. Thank you, Kristen. So one... Um, one question I have, so I presume you, you didn't present this because you didn't have enough time, it's really quite limited time, but I'm thinking around the kind of how do you incentivize people uh, to, to save more and how do you make it more interactive, for example, how would you use some of the insights from uh, behavioral science, things like mental accounting, for example, mm -hmm. to, to get people more engaged uh, with this uh, saver, um, payroll savings product? I, I, so actually, I would, I would say I'm, this is a uh, bold opinion, but I don't want people to be engaged. I want them to make one decision and then have this savings nest egg and obviously make it easy for people to understand where their balance is, withdraw. We, we don't want to hide anything, but I, I think we overemphasize engagement within savings um, way too much. Like habit formation is tough. One decision, making it easy at the time of enrollment, I think is, is kind of where the field needs to go versus habits. So do you think we can't really make it fun then? I mean, we should, sort of shouldn't bother trying with that. I mean, I, I think generally regulation makes it tough to do automatic enrollment. So if you can't do automatic enrollment and you can't do a default because of regulation, I think this is go back to the Dan Ariely thing. As soon as you can remove all the friction, <coughs> great. If you can't remove all the friction, you need to add fuel or motivation. And I think that's where savings is kind of, because regulation makes it difficult to make it easy, we have to add some motivation. And I don't want us to start there. I want us to really push on the making it easy. Uh, Bertrand. Um, I'm interested, what, what is your business model of your, this company project? <laughs> yeah, so we, um, so Common Sense basically works with um, fintech providers and banks and credit unions in order to push them to do things that increase consumer health. And um, the reality is we've had a really tough time uh, getting this off the ground because we first thought about the UI we didn't think about the business incentive. Mm -hmm. And so the UI is, again, very, very simple, um, but the, we've gotten no's because of the, the incentive. And they're not no's, right? They're basically like, we'll do it later, and we'll do it in a year. And so that's actually a no. So really kind of the opportunity here is to innovate on the fee model, which, again, since we're helping low-income Americans, it's actually counterintuitive. We don't really like fees, but that could be actually how we get these larger providers to do anything. Polly. So... If somebody's making like £2,000 a month and currently ending the month with £0, not making any savings, and you default to £100 to their savings account, so £1,900 comes into their current account, what are they going to not buy? And what do we know about how that changes people's kind of financial outcomes? Because, you know, it's perfectly possible that people are just sort of wasting £100 on random yeah. nonsense. But whereas, you know, from Plum, we've heard, uh, like, there's, there's some sort of real money coming back here from... Uh, from the, the, the switching to better energy providers, in the end, people are just... Uh, are you certain that people are just wasting money? And, won't, and, and what's the risk that they, their savings account, in fact, this then come, gets pulled in to deal with emergencies because they didn't buy the repair? Or, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So this is a, a very valid critique, and this is kind of what David Lipson and team have found with retirement savings, is if you actually take too much from the paycheck, people could overdraft or take it from other places. Um, I think the proposal here is is less aggressive in just saying, let's change the default. Right now, the default is 100% into checking. What we want is the default to be a little bit into savings. And so we're just changing the system to make it easier for people to save, not that it, that is exactly what they have to do. Like, we, we want people to be able to withdraw. We want people to be able to get the money. 
Um, but conceptually, the system right now is just not working for people to have the nest egg. So then we say, well, and the system should also be helping people reduce expenses and helping people make trade-offs. And so th this is not the only thing that financial health has, but it's, it's the basic starting point that we should have to redesign the system. What other questions do you have? Yeah, Pantelis. Um, so I'm um, going to go back to, again, the, uh, the pensions auto-enrollment auto example that I gave uh, earlier, which is, and, and the, part of the criticism there as well is that because we were defaulting people into it, they're actually um, not contributing it contributing enough. Yep. So, uh, so somebody who is starting to save at, the, at age 30, in order to get a comfortable retirement income, they need to be saving around 16% of their income. Yep. And I think the average is around seven. So, um, and because we have this minimum, um, people are kind of comfortable in that. So if you, if you engage people at the beginning and have a kind of a fairly low savings contribution, say just they only do one or 2%, but in six months later, you, you know that it's better for them if they, you know, based on the, their data, for yeah. example, that, you know, basically you have a lot of money going into the current account, but not in the savings account, for example. How would you re-engage them, given that you said that kind of yeah. engagement is not really the solution here, it's more about making it easy? So I think this is plump, because you, you basically say at, at some level right now, a percentage is dumb. It doesn't actually look at your income. It doesn't look at anything else. If we think about where financial health is going, it's actually looking at all of the variables that you have, your income and your expenses. So because I don't have any faith in banks and payrolls providers to do this, we can start with a dumb solution, which is just a percentage. But we really should be moving to an AI technology that looks at kind of a smart way to increase it automatically. You know, people can pre-commit to increases over time. They can pre-commit to when you have windfalls to save a little bit more. All those things are added on a basic level of system that says we want to help make savings easier from the paycheck. Any other final questions? And remember, everybody else, you can start putting your questions into Slido and do say, do say who they're for, for for later on, whether they're for, for Max or for Kristen and later. Any final questions you'd like to check on? In terms of, uh, um, again, the business model, you know, like engaging with banks is, is, you know, it might take quite a while because it, it looks like it's an application, it's more like a B2B sort of model where you engage with employers or banks, which is quite a daunting task um, as opposed to, you know, like an open... Yeah, I think, so I think that's why it hasn't been done is because it's very difficult and the business model is, is hard. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. And so we have time. Uh, so I would say generally what, we, what we've seen work with banks and uh, payroll providers is just thought leadership. And so you go to them and you say you can win a challenge or you can win some thought leadership and you will put you in a press release and you can motivate action through that way. And so we have to kind of use all the tricks in our book to get, if we don't have policy, we have to figure out how to move these big players because really it's kind of our current default is like, why don't people save? It's like, it's because it's easier not to. So we have to make it easier to save, and, and then we'll change the economics of it. Well, thank you very much for that. So now we have our third and, and final pitch, and this is from Archie Chapel. Archie is Director of Strategic Affairs at a company called Wagestream. Um, before that, he was Head of Early Stage Investments at Big Issue Invest, and he's developed an open banking tool called Big View. Archie, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, so just starting off, uh, what does Wagestream do? We enable people to access a percentage of their earned income as and when they need it throughout the month. So if you are employed by one of our partner organizations, you have kind of the potential to access liquidity at any point. So meet Sarah. She's kind of like the north star, I guess, of our organization. Um, she's an actual user uh, from one of our partners, David Lloyd Jims, um, and she represents over half of the working population. So I guess this is our problem statement. Um, she works full time, supports her family, has high levels of household debt, but then has average income, um, and has less than 250 pound savings, which is obviously a solution that Plum are trying to solve. Um, and the main thing is she does not have excellent credit. And that may be due to a paucity of data points in terms of a thin file, or just the fact that she's had historically bad performance on any credit obligations. So what does the market respond to someone like Sarah with? And in general, it's, uh, it's fairly shocking, um, i.e. either expensive or over-provisioned, or in both cases, or some cases, both. Uh, so what we're always looking to do is to enable individuals to access liquidity without utilizing kind of a credit lever. So then one of our partner organizations, David Lloyd, they similarly have problems, not of the same nature, but mainly around how they schedule, i.e. how they fill their kind of 
not used um, uh, shifts, uh, specifically there, how do you then build in a kind of re uh, work reimbursement trade-off to enable people to take more shifts if they can get reimbursed immediately after that work is completed? Secondly, every time they lose a member of staff, that has high levels of cost. And then thirdly, just around us, they do provide advances to their staff, but at high cost due to chaps. So what we did is we built WageStream that sits in between these two organizations. So one, it gives Sarah the ability to basically access a percentage of her wages, in this case, 50%. So an example would be, if she earns 2,000 pounds a month, it is week three, she has earned 1,500 pounds in theory, she would be able to access up to 750 pounds of that money. The pricing model on this is that we charge a SAS fee to David Lloyd, uh, and then we have a flat £1.75 to Sarah, irregardless of amount. And what that means is that throughout the whole month, she never gets credit scored, credit checked, she's able to access her money when she requires it, and therefore never has to engage with an, in theory, bad consumer credit market at this current time. So what is the current data saying about how our users are engaging with WageStream. So we have 150,000 people currently live on our platform. And the first thing everyone always says to us is, well, actually, you know, if, if you give people access to their earnings, they'll just draw down 100% of the access, because that's how they engage historically with other financial instruments. What we see is totally reverse. So as you see there, only, well, of, sorry, 75% of our users draw down less than 10% of their earned income. So what that means in our, our eyes is that borrowers, or rather individuals, see money that they have earned very differently to money that they can get or borrow from the financial system. And secondly, when people are utilizing our product, and that is one to seven days before payroll runs. The main thing there is that we are actually providing the service that we set out to provide, that people are using this exactly how they need to, and that is to income stream themselves for the last week. Finally, what they say about us and what the kind of social impact of what we do is. So that is avoiding taking payday loans. 38% of our users actively used us as an alternative to a payday loan, which has mass savings to them individually and society as a whole. And then in terms of being able to fulfill that unexpected bill that was referenced earlier, 52%, and then reduced feelings of stress at 57%. As you can see, these are not all uses of, you know, people want to go out and get boozed on a Thursday. It's mo mainly they have a need that they would normally go to a credit card provider for or a lender for, who would then over-provision them and then get into a cycle of debt. Well, with us, you never get into that cycle. That is it. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so, Polly, let me start, start with you with this one, because I think this, this very much fits in with the area you're working in. How, what, what would you like to ask? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know about this product. I really like this product. I guess there, there is the risk that you've identified. I wonder if you can talk us through a bit more that people uh, draw down their wages in the middle of the month. And on the previous slide, you actually had somebody suggesting they'd paid their rent with it, mm -hmm. which I'm hoping was not an unexpected bill. No, no. Um, so, yeah. But uh, so they're able to pay on time. They're clearly their pay and their rent are out of step in a way that's problematic. Um, uh, if they draw down their money early and then can't their, meet their bills at the end of the month, that's I guess that's the risk. Yeah. So that was why we built in caps because that was everyone's first question. It's the does this not result in people taking basically putting themselves in worse financial positions by the end of the month? And what we have seen is that we put in the cap because we are like, yeah, we probably agree that that is what people do because that's how historically they access their or utilize their financial products. But all the data suggests to us that is just simply not. And then in terms of our user and or how we speak to our users, we ask them, you know, why is it that you're only utilizing this much? You could use 50%, but yet you're using five. And they say, well, money that I've earned is very, very different to money that I can get from a bank. Because when I go to a bank, I think I'm not actually going to be able to, this may be my only shot. So I'm going to go and borrow more than I need to. And since I'm firefighting on a daily basis, that then gets used up. Then I get into a spiral of debt. 
World Wage Stream, since it is there and always accessible for you on your phone, you can draw down exactly how much you need and at what time, so as to properly provide income smoothing. And just on the kind of the monthly pay thing, I think that's like an anchoring problem, ultimately, is that all we're saying is that people should be able to access their money as when they need it because it's their money. And that for too long, I guess, employers have had all the benefits of a monthly pay cycle with individuals internalising all of those costs. So how can we kind of even the playing field, I guess, on that? And do you not find with some individuals, though, that they do just spend it all straight away? You know, and so we have, so of get, our... Get to the cap very quickly. Yeah, so of our, what is it? So of 150,000 uh, individuals on the platform, we have seen 75 that over, over two months have taken more. And that is with the parameters being very strict against us, i.e. 0.1%. So that would be an individual who took 9.7% and then took 9.8% the next month. If you then widen those to be 5%, that goes down to 6 So then we can very much target that individual. We, since we have a relationship with both the employer and the employee, and the employer has a portal where they can see all of the behaviours of their staff around this, we then say, this is what we're seeing here. You could look at that, or maybe there's a problem elsewhere that we do not know about. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bertrand? So, um, a very interesting solution. Obviously, uh, what it entails is you lending money to people in advance, right? No, not at all. So, what we do is we lend, in theory, we provide a credit facility to a company, mm-hmm. and then they forward their wages, but we are not lending to any individuals. We do not. Okay, so I was going to say, who's, who's, where are you sourcing the lending from? I mean, some. So we have, we have a financial, we have a bank who supports us to basically front load okay. those and, drawdowns. And capital costs money, so who's paying for the... So that's interest. built in two ways. One, the SAS fee, mm-hmm. and then also a tiny bit into that 175, but actually not really due to the fact that stability of things, because our money is only ever out for a month in theory, you have very little cost of capital. On that piece. Well, it's, it's only out for a month, but on a con- constantly rotating Yeah, but since you're, if you're working across multiple different organisations mm-hmm. who all run payroll at different times, which is not everyone pays on the 31st, we have lunar cycles, we have weekly, we have bi-monthly, we have monthly, and then we have people, all councils pay on the 15th, etc. So the money flows, we are not going 25 million out and 25 million in, mm-hmm. the money is just kind of always sitting at a certain level, which means the cost of that capital is very small, but then that gets eaten by our SAS fee that we charge to an employer. Okay. Uh, Pantelis. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I was, um, you know, when we are talking, about, I was thinking about the research that was done by uh, Shafir and Malay Nathan on, uh, on uh, scarcity, uh, scarcity mindset, and, and effectively, for, uh, most of you know about this, but, effect, you know, what it says is that when people are under stress, it kind of captures their mind and, and promotes kind of this kind of tunnel vision, uh, and people become kind of less insightful, less forward-looking, less less controlled. And it was interesting that you focus very much on the kind of the immediate financial benefits of having your product, which is kind of not getting a payday loan, which is a very expensive credit product. But I, I think there's kind of additional benefits here in terms of kind of freeing up your kind of so-called mental bandwidth mm-hmm. when you're making those decisions so you can deal with other problems. So I think there is a, you know, I think there's a kind of opportunity here for you to think about, you know, how do I um, exploit this timing to get, if, if, I, if I can make people more forward-looking, for example, to save more. Yeah. So, so, for example, do you, do you, I guess my question is, do you have any plans to further exploit this, this timing in order to uh, help people save in addition to, in, to, in addition to this? Yeah, very much so. So I think similar to the effects we see within the consumer credit market, i.e. that the market is not set up to actually deliver services to someone like Sarah, similarly the savings market we found isn't suited for her either. So to provide a service which is liquid and provides kind of small kind of buffer stock savings rather than pushing people into fixed term ISAs or at least fixed length saving solutions. How do you deliver a £150 um, savings pot that they can just utilise as and when they need it? So that is currently being built and the kind of MVP of that is already launched in certain partners um, to see how that works. But the main thing there is get the 150 so that they can use that potentially over wage stream um, and then start directing people to other forms of saving products such as Plum or whoever it may be. 
And, and there's a question here for Archie, actually, from uh, the audience, which is, which is uh, relevant to what you've just been talking about. Do you have any comparisons of the total amounts that people draw down versus what they would have taken in overdrafts or payday loans or advances? So our, our average drawdown is £68. So the question there is, if they went to a payday loan, the minimum or majority of loans, the minimum they would have been able to access is £200. So an answer a lot of people say is, why don't they go to someone like a credit union if they were in a uh, kind of public sector organisation? Credit unions won't lend less than £200. So you have an innate problem there, which is they only need 68. So you, they probably could access it from a credit union, but you're over-indebting people unnecessarily. Uh, so that's the point there. And then on a credit, like a credit card, assumes they do get access, but if their credit score is of a certain type, they may not. So actually what will occur is that they will be paying far more, and since they're firefighting, they will probably utilise the max amount, i.e. if it is a credit card of £500. So what we view as our saving is the fact that no one will provision this service to this market because they can't take the credit risk that we have access to. And there's also a question for you, Archie, about do employees feel comfortable with their employer knowing about their financial behaviour? You're not... They run payroll, so they know that people are just getting paid the same amount, ultimately. So in terms of... Don't they know when they take... Do they not know when they, they take They can it? see if they decide to go into our portal and deep dive and select one person. So the only person who has access is the HRD. So if the HRD really wants to find out about you and they could go down and see how you're using it, <coughs> that is a possibility... Our, our thing is that, okay, if that wasn't the case, the individual, if they'd really need an advance, would have had to historically go and ask their HRD anyway. And actually not the HRD, their manager, who would ask their manager, who then maybe would ask the HRD. So I don't know in terms of that, everything's delivered in the privacy of your own home on our, on our platform. <laughs> um, but let's say that you have a very nosy HRD. Uh, all you're seeing, really, is that people are accessing their money when they want so if the HRD is so obsessed with an anchoring on a monthly software, you would think they probably wouldn't have gone with WageStream, but the implication being they have WageStream, so they understand that there's a requirement for this type of thing. So to then judge people for using the type of thing they've provisioned seems like they wouldn't necessarily be delivering on what they yeah. wanted to in the yeah. first place. Now, Max, there's a question about privacy for you as well. It's why would people give your app access to all their financial accounts in order to receive commercial uh, messages about switching energy provider, etc.? Yeah, so I think, I think that's uh, maybe a misunderstanding of, of what I meant when I said we're offering you uh, an opportunity to, to switch energy provider. We're not, like, offering you out to the market and, uh, uh, you know, and sharing all of your data with all of the uh, hundreds of suppliers and, and thousands of tariffs that they have. We're analysing uh, the data that we have about you, and we are finding uh, uh, a, uh, a switch that we think can save you money. We're not sharing data with anyone else. Um, and uh, in terms of commercial, right, so the way Plum makes money is, uh, is if we make you money, right? So, um, so the commercial interest is supposed to be completely aligned. So, um, you know, we are essentially like your finance department, <coughs> your finance director, who is, uh, who is constantly looking for ways to optimise uh, for you. Um, but, yeah, we're certainly not trying to share your data uh, around. It would be within Plum, um, and, and that's the deal. And we've got lots of questions coming in. Um, uh, Kristen, somebody says, many companies allow you to direct your whole paycheck into your savings account, so wouldn't your system uh, discourage people from doing that? I don't think in America. Right. It, I, don't, I don't know the UK market as well. In the US, there's Digit and there's other apps that try to help you save, but there's not many things that come at the point of the paycheck in fact, I don't think any that come at the point of the paycheck. And people are also asking, have you got any behavioural ideas on how to encourage people to keep their money in the savings account once it's in there and not to take it out yeah. and spend it? Great call. So, so I think it's okay if people also take out their money. So, so this is what savings for. You have a car repair, you have health insurance. So we have to kind of balance having enough motivation to keep it in there and, and easy to take out. Um, but some ideas that, that we play with are, are increasing friction. So you can basically make something easy for somebody to do by decreasing the friction, but you can add friction if you want to make it harder. So you can imagine adding some steps, adding some questions. 
Um, we think about goal grading and progress. So if people are going to $500, can you create smaller milestones so that you're actually hitting a $50 or $150 so people feel progress and they want to make that milestone? Um, and then uh, things like pre-commitment. So you could ask people up front, um, and, and we've done this in other apps, uh, to pre-commit to when they want to take it out and how much they want to take out and what for. And then at the point of taking it out, you can remind them of their intentions, that they, if this, they're actually taking it out for the car repair or the health uh, care. So generally, kind of the behavioral toolkit is, is at our fingertips as soon as you have the base level system set. And Archie, this is an interesting question. Someone says, isn't your system um, one that could be just replaced by employers paying their staff weekly and overcoming the whole problem? Yeah, you, you should. Um, there's a reason employers pay monthly, uh, and that is because paying weekly is highly complex for any of you run payroll uh, and is very time-consuming. Um, secondly, companies like to either float or kind of uh, cash flow themselves over a monthly period. So convincing them to pay monthly when they have to do different budgets, have worse cash flow and more complex systems is unlikely to happen. I totally agree that if you could pay weekly, you would solve one part of the problem we are solving. Um, but I would be amazed uh, if you would be able to convince employers to do that. So that's the big thing. We've had examples where of companies who are moving from weekly up to monthly pay because just to run weekly is too time consuming and far too costly. Um, and they've actually used WageStream as a way to basically provision to their staff the same sort of effect uh, as they would have got. But again, since ours is that instant access and then solves things such as kind of if an unexpected cost, blah, blah, comes up, that you can still pay for it. So it's not just, the benefits are not just constricted to a weekly system. If that makes sense. May I jump in for yeah. just a, I think this is, a, this is kind of quite relevant to a lot of the discussion that's happening in the UK around benefits payments, and that actually a lot of people are arguing that you should have, uh, peop, it's, I mean, you make it easier for people if you, if you give the benefits payment every week or every two weeks. I think in Scotland it's actually every mm -hmm. two weeks. Um, so, but it does seem that the biggest driver for not doing it is cost. It's not so much that it's not a kind of an ideological reason, I think. So potentially actually having these other tools can help in this, in, yeah. in this way. I, I, Oh, sorry. No, just on that. I mean, actually, the idea of moving from two weekly benefits payments to monthly uh, payment, benefits payments was, uh, I guess, ideological, but it was deliberate in order to make life easier for the transition from being out of work to in work, because lots of people found that going from two weekly payment cycle to a monthly payment cycle meant that as they got a job, they went into financial instability and found that very difficult. Now, of course, it would be much easier to do things like wage stream to level down the experience of being uh, in work than try and level up the, the financial management of dealing with a monthly payment cycle onto people on the lowest incomes. But, you know, that's just... It, 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 so it's not just a sort of accident or let's reduce payment processing costs. It was actually... that. It seems to me that the kind of tools like WageStream are really, really valuable for allowing people to move away from the monthly cycle. But we also need to think about the fact that most bills come out on a monthly basis as well. And actually shifting people... Lots of people find weekly payment cycles difficult mm -hmm. if they have to save up to be able to pay their rent or their mortgage at the end of the month, which is the biggest thing, that they haven't got enough money. So, sorry. Just to add a, another, a, another point is, um, I think um, there, there's a real um, complexity around education around financial topics. There's a, very, there's a huge lack of education around schools. Uh, even, a, you know, people come to universities have no understanding how to manage their finances. And I think um, there's a lot of projects out there to try to help, you know, do that. But generally, you, you can go through the whole school system and never be, have a one class about how to, what is money, uh, what, what, what does the word debt means, or, you know, and it's quite... Um, but wouldn't these kinds of apps help you overcome that? Because you well, don't that, necessarily need, how much do you need to know to be able to use them? That, that's exactly what I was going to ask. Is how, how would you embed a sort of level of education for people to be able to understand better what they're doing as opposed to just... Because the, the applications are all very valid, but, um, you know, how do you help people actually understand that's better what they That's an interesting question they're doing? to all of you, I think, yeah. So, Max, I'll go along. Shall I start? Um, so, I mean, it's similar to the answer to Pantelis's question, right? That actually what I think all of us are suggesting is making financial decisions easier. Because even if you have a high level of education, you know, right? Like if, if we've studied behavioral science, quite a few people in this room, like even if you have a high level of education, like the statistics professors that I think 
can't remember who tested statistics professors and worked out that they make the same basic statistics mistakes as people who are not, um, uh, who are not sophisticated. So actually, what I think all of the suggestions that we've made today are is actually to make financial decisions easier because they are really hard even if you are educated. And hypothesis, if you make better decisions that make you better off, that might engage you. And, and if they're easier to go through the flow of all the things that Plum wants to do or, or the other people on this stage want to do, if you can make more of those positive decisions, then hopefully you can get a nice kind of virtuous circle going. And Kristen, what, what would you say to that? Um, I would echo that. So, so sadly, as many of you know, there's, there's very little research in financial literacy or financial education that correlates to behavior change. So John Lynch and Daniel Fernandez did a very nice meta-analysis of around 200 studies of financial literacy and found close to 0% effect on behavior change. So I think, sadly, it's a very intuitive opportunity to focus on literacy and education, but we really should redirect efforts to, to making things easy. Um, and I, I think that's you know, the upside of, of tech, right, is that you can just make things much easier, and kind of the opportunity then is to integrate that into people's lives. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, um, yeah, okay. I, I didn't study behavioral science. So I was spending too much time doing philosophy, so I can't really answer specifically around that. Um, but what I would say is that specifically around how we help people is there's this amazing thing in our app is that people use it kind of like a toothbrush, check in the morning, check in the evening. One of the key things they do that is it's the first time they've ever seen their shifts and how their shifts relate to how much money goes into their account. So that is a high usage. They go like, look, I completed that. Oh, my God, that's actually how much I earn, and that's how much I've got. So you can make very complex structures around this, and I'm sure that there are ways where that can be really beneficial. But for us, giving people the access to just see how their work results in how they get paid, what that money really looks like, how they can then spend that over the month has been really powerful. We do obviously have a lot of like financial education, so we have content on there from uh, kind of the money charity um, and money advice service or NPS. Uh, and that's all great in terms of directing people if they have certain types of problems that we cannot solve, such as debt consolidation issues, etc. Um, but just for financial literacy point of view, I'm maybe in the minority who actually believe people are very good at um, managing their money. And I think if we look at like a benefit example, people did better when we had multiple benefits before it got wrapped on into universal credit because they could cash flow themselves, because they understood what they needed or what they had on a day-to-day -day basis, and they could do that. As soon as we then move it to a monthly system, we say, no, what, what looks like really good money management is if you can stretch over a month. And I'm, I'm not necessarily that sure that's true, and I think people are much better at when they can see what they have and how they can then behave on a day-to-day -day basis on that. And do you two think that people are not so good with their money? Uh, no, no, no. I'd like, I, I think, as I said at the start, I think the problem is not people. The problem is the system. Right? So the problem is that the system expects far too much of people um, and expects them to make decisions in a way that they just don't the vast majority of the time. If we had unlimited time, like all of us are capable of being like econs, right? Like we can all learn to do maths at a really high level. It's just like life, right? Like life is, is there's lots of stuff to do. And that means that you, you use these shortcuts, which behavioral science can help us understand. And I think that's completely true. And also, I'm very down on financial education. But all of the banks and the financial conduct authority, all of them, they love it. And it's because what they want is a really, really complicated system. And when consumer representatives come forward and say, but people don't understand this, they can't interact with it, they're like, it's okay, we'll educate them. Mm. You're like, just make it simple mm. so that you don't have to. And so, honestly, they spend millions and millions of pounds traipsing around schools, basically selling current accounts, but supposedly <laughs> educating the public. And this is a really long-term strategy, right? If your plan is to teach seven-year-olds, like, it's going to take a long time, even if you proved that it worked, to turn that into a financial literate population that can manage to read a 93-page terms and conditions document before they take it alone. Mm. And Kirsten, there's a, there's a question for you here about how are you sure that your interventions don't cross an ethical line and are too overbearing if you're charging people if they don't use it? Um, I mean, this is a consideration. So, so I think right now um, we, we think about trying to motivate uh, behavior, and so as you, we could make it really easy for banks to do something, but if we can't make it really easy for banks to actually add savings into their repertoire of services, we can basically make it so that they can make a profit on it. So right now, banks are making a profit on people's mistakes with overdrafts. And so the proposal is less, 
have people make a profit on people's mistakes, but actually, if you don't turn on automatic transfers, then you could have a fee. And so we're not proposing anything like hidden fees or anything like this, but I think we have to start testing kind of some strong and big ideas in, the, in this area to figure out what actually works. But what? Uh, sorry, it, it flashed it up. I just and it was 100% Archie. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's won. Um, yeah. Yes, the voting is not now, yet. There was a quick question, if I could ask yeah. Archie. Yeah. It was about if someone left their company, I think. Did I see that right? If someone left if, their if company. If someone quits, what would happen? Yeah, what would happen? So the main thing is, remember, this is only what they've earned. So they, if they've not worked that shift, they simply cannot access, access any money. So as they leave, when payroll runs to pay them their final salary check, ours will just come out of that. So that's, there's, there's, there's no like chasing, there's no debt here. It's, it's only money that you've actually earned. So they can walk out that day, but they, they can walk out that day if they have any extra money. Yeah, so they'll, on their app, the app would only give what they've worked the day before that. Um, and then if they've taken out X amount, the company will run payroll one last time for them. It will then stream through our wage stream account. Um, and then the uh, money will be reimbursed to us and they'll have the final paycheck. Well, I'd like our judges to go through in turn now. We want to talk about each bit and the strengths and weaknesses so that people can then vote. And we, and we, have, we have 10 minutes, so we have a little while to talk about it, where we can talk about um, each one. Um, so to try to correct for primacy and recency effects, let's, um, let's do um, Kristin first. So uh, what do people think about... Kristen's app. Who'd like to start? Pantelis. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, fundamentally, I think it's a great idea, but I think there is, at the moment, there's a, kind of, there's a few question marks around the, the implementation, obviously, and, and I think there's definitely, uh, with this, um, with these products, I think a lot of the times the devil is in the detail, and in terms of kind of setting up the process uh, and, and linking kind of the payroll savings to, to, to a savings product, for example, things like that. So um, I would say... I, I still kind of um, think, believe that engagement is important. So, yes, you do want to automate things. And I think the same goes to, uh, to, to um, Max as well, is that I, I do think that, uh, you know, making, making it easy for people is, is one of the most kind of powerful kind of behavioral principles. And it was, it was probably 60 years old from Kurt Lewin. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a new idea. But I think... Um, it, it is important at the same time to kind of to get people to engage with it, and so to kind of because this is going to maintain interest and and in, into the into the app and also kind of optimize it. So, uh, but um, so for Archie, I think this is um, no. Sorry, I, we're just doing Kristen now. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. That's it. I think. Thank you. Thank you, um, Polly. Uh, so I, I share that view that this is you know incredibly simple, potentially transformative, and. Uh, it's true that whilst the other guys are presenting a product, as it were, that's there for the market, Kristen is trying to sell something to everybody, so it's an idea, and therefore the kind of the immediate delivery problem is there. But I'm less worried about that because she's also therefore suggesting something that is comprehensive, whereas the other guys are never. I don't think your plan is to have 100% market share. Maybe it is. You have to know. employed. So, so I, I don't. I don't think we should kind of downgrade her for being a consultant who sells to everyone instead of having an actual direct-to-market product. I guess my concern is uh, that I, I, I think there's just still a gap in our understanding of what is the money that people are wasting that they are not saving. Um, because if... And, and it's, you know, uh, the example that Max had of a, a woman with her kids is an interesting person who has a huge household debt, 15 or so thousand pounds, and then is also relying on short-term credit, potentially... And it's interesting to think about uh, us building a market where there are people with savings and credit card debts mm. and because it's become too easy in default. And I, it's that structural challenge that I think is much more difficult. Um, I don't have much more to add. I totally um, correlate with the, the comments here. Uh, I, I, I would add to, to your point, to the last point, is I, I still you know, struggle with understanding how uh, people behave uh, as an example, a friend of mine who's a, mother, a single mother of two, you know, she 
when she got a, um, a penalty uh, car uh, parking ticket, you know, instead of paying the forty pounds up front straight away, so you're done, she's going to end up paying the hundred twenty pounds because she's going to delay it forgetting the invoice because uh, the, the 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 penalty is she's going to drop it somewhere on the table is not going to be dealt with. So how do we change that behaviour so that you know, there's no wastage in her wages so that you know she can actually do save that eighty pounds difference. And then let's talk about uh, arches. Do you want to start? Sorry, be sure. before you move on, can, yeah. I, can I just say that uh, I'm a big fan of Kristen's work and her colleagues' work, particularly in the Common Sense Lab, um, and I really like this idea, and we're working on new saving rules uh, within Plum. And I think combining it with the uh, protection of reading your transaction data and working out where you are, perhaps after a payday boost, yeah. I think could be really impactful. So... I think regardless of if anything comes out, it's certainly an idea that I'm going to uh, think about using within Plum. I like the idea the competitors could all join up. That's, yeah. that's great. Then you can all win. Winners everywhere, which is great. Okay. Uh, yes. Are, are you gonna, so, Archie. What are you going to cut the book in two? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, great product, great idea. It seems to have gone quite far already. Um, I um, think that's really good. Uh, I still think um, it, will, it might not stop, you know, get somebody else getting a, a payday loan at the, you know, halfway through anyway. So, you know, how do you stop that behavior um, of, of getting additional debt beyond this product is, is can, important. Can I to ask me. why? What's, what, what, what's, why do you think that people would take on? But because they, I, I agree, they may, we don't do you Because it, it might be limited to how much you can get with hair and then, you know, like a, something else happened or, you know, a big night out and next thing you know is they need to go for, um, you know, another, another, another top up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Polly. So, yeah, my, I guess uh, the, the gap I see in wage stream is only sort of slightly linked to that, but that um, actually if you take 50, certainly I, I, I earn perfectly reasonable salary. If I took 50% of my wages half way through the month, I wouldn't have enough for the mortgage. And, and I think it's just missing the cap being more than just a percentage of it being slightly more informed in the way Plum is by a, a knowledge of what are the bills that are going to come at the end of the month. And even if you allow people to take the money, being able to say, um, if you take this money now, you're going to need to do some extra shifts if you're going to be, want to be able to meet your rent or so, something like that. I think there's opportunity for more sophistication and more personalization there. But that said, I think wage stream is the one that's most kind of systemically fascinating because, you know, most companies, especially most companies run by uh, uh, the people like us in the policy profession, or research profession work for pay monthly, so we assume that's the norm, and then we assess, uh, we sort of impose some kind of value judgments on people who find it difficult to be paid monthly, as if they're somehow worse than us. When actually they're just used to a different default. And I, 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 I think uh, you know, again, as Archie said, it's the employers who've benefited from the kind of the cash management benefit of this monthly cycle. And why is that right? Why is that good? And disrupting that. Uh, is really fascinating to me. And it, it may be that actually if people could control the money in and the money out in a more sophisticated, immediate ways, you, they would have much better financial outcomes rather than a system that's designed for landlords and cash flow management of employers, which the current one seems to be. Mm -hmm. Can, can I just quickly ask, how many people have you got already going? Uh, 150,000 in terms of employees, and then we work with 80 uh, companies, although with that, our target for 2020, June 2020, is 1 million, which is our low estimate. That's very impressive. Uh, Pantelis. Uh, great, thank you. I, I mean, I don't have any comments on the product itself. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I, I am uh, really looking forward to seeing what you're doing with the savings part as well, because I think it, it is a, there's an opportunity here to create better habits uh, mm. around savings as well. So I, I am very look, looking forward to seeing what you do with that. All right, and uh, Kristen, who'd like to start there? There's, we're on to Max, aren't we? Sorry, sorry, we've done, Kristen. Max. Thank you again, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Max, who'd can like I, to start can there? I start with, yeah. Uh, so, 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 some, so I think Max, just to kind of um, uh, follow up on what Polly was saying earlier as well, I think there's a unique opportunity here to really understand a little bit, delve deeper into the uh, kind of the drivers for some kind of savings behaviour. Uh, and you know what is what is good saving, and what is you know what, what is because you you can optimize it potentially. I think there is um, there is a, uh, an opportunity to use the data for good here as well. And um, especially I think with um, 
because you know, I, I, mean, I, I said you know the sample of two from my, uh, and I, I, I am looking forward to seeing what you do in terms of research. It's going to be the higher sample size and provide more insights around kind of getting getting to know people's understanding around that. Yeah, that's really exciting for me as well. I'm only starting to get into the data science. There's a question there about like one-to-one personalization. Yes, like it, it, the saving run, it runs for you personally based on your transaction data. Um, and actually, that's the really exciting thing that I want to do over the next three, six, nine months is actually work out, given that we have like personal uh, savings uh, histories and how we've interacted with them, how can we help them like, increase their savings, make sure that they're saving in the right way? All of those things are incredibly exciting. For the, you know, we've got hundreds of thousands of users that, can, uh, that we can potentially learn from. And Polly and Bertrand, on what do you make of Max's? Because then we need to vote. I, I really like uh, this two, I think what's uh, the, the sort of most exciting is that it's trying to engage with actually getting people to spend less. Because so often in the savings... Uh, debate, we forget to re- forget that actually that it requires people to spend less in order to save more, and we assume that having the money in a savings account will result in people spending less, but we forget that there might be other ways to get people to spend less, like switching their energy provider or, or other triggers, and I think you're the only person who's really talking about that, so that's exciting, but I guess the downside is it's, there's, there's lots of things that are a bit like this, and it's not as, as completely transformational, that's my fear. I'm uh, Yeah, I really like the product, uh, the ideas. Uh, I, I really like the, the, what, what Polly was saying, the, the multiple facet of, of the, the different pieces and about reducing uh, spending. And I still come back to the, you know, uh, penalty, the, the uh, parking penalty charge. How do you, how do you engage with these? That uh, there's, a, there's a big thing called open banking license nowadays where you can get access to people's actually finances. Um, that's what Revolut and Monza are doing. And I think if you are able to get a license through that, then you'll be able to actually get a lot of very useful insights from people and maybe develop uh, the product that way. Okay, so if so people haven't just, just, just to already... say, sorry, we, we do use open banking. That's what okay, we use. Great. Okay. If people haven't voted already, now is your moment to vote for Max and Plum, for Kristin and Irrational Labs, and for, or for Archie and Waystream. Do your voting now, because it is all to play for. It's good. disenfranchised. <laughs> Do we, Do we have it? all the voting in? Maybe we'll get to tie break. I, know I, have, I have the answers. 92, 94. Do you need more time? Are you still voting? Everybody's done it. How many people are in this 99. room? Hit 100, go on, hit 100. Yeah. Everyone. Everyone. Everybody's done it, yeah. And so the winner is Plum and Max. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to all of you three for being such um, good sports of doing this, because I think it's been quite fun. And thank you very much to our three um, judges um, as well. Um, Pantelis, very briefly, where do you um, see the field going? You've been, you've been um, before we end, you were going to give me your thoughts on just where you see this field going. So, um, the, so we're very much focusing on... Uh, Helping, I think savings is a, kind of a key target in, in helping people financial, uh, meet their financial goals. And I think a lot of the products that we, the products that we discussed are, are quite key. And also helping people manage their spending. But also something that we haven't, uh, we haven't mentioned uh, in this talk is, is around financial guidance as well. And getting people to seek help when it's, when it's necessary. I think that's kind of a key objective I think we should be, we should be aiming towards. Uh, and so there's tons of things as well. Around, I mean, there's also kind of other things in financial services around retail investment, you know, affordable credit. Uh, this is a really key area that we need to um, uh, we need to be pushing towards getting people to uh, find alternative forms of credit because there's it's it's out there. There's a lot of alternative forms of credit out there, but people just don't know about it. Um, so and um, uh, yeah, and pensions. Pensions well, is a big area. This is an area where we're sure to see more and more um, innovation as time goes on. It is lunchtime now. Um, We will be starting again at 2.30pm sharp, but thank you very much to all our judges, and in particular, thank you very much to our pitchers for being such good sports. (laughs) 